Really, for all of you. We are all doing well this week. We all shouted and sang the songs, and we had a wonderful worship exhortation. We joyful in singing to the Lord for the great work that He has done in our lives. So keep up the spirit like that. We'll go on. It's really, in fact, uh, there's nothing to worry in the presence of the Lord. Of course, in reality, there are some things which can bring our thoughts into captivity for something else. <coughs> but let's uh, bring our thoughts into captivity to the Lord because He is in control of everything. So today's uh, message is titled Glorifying God Through Our Lives. Let's uh, open our Bibles. to the Gospel according to John, chapter 1. We are going to read some portion here and then another portion in Hebrews. Let's read from John now. Uh, John chapter 1, verses 14, verses 17 and 18. John chapter 1. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we saw his glory, glory as of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. In verse 17, For the law was given to Moses, and grace and truth were realized through Jesus Christ. Verse 18, No one has seen God at any time, the only begotten God, who is in the bosom of the Father. He has explained him, declared him. Let's uh, move to Hebrew chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11. Let's read from verse uh, 23. Hebrew chapter 11, verse 23 to 29. Let me read these verses. By faith, Moses, when he was born, was hidden for three months by his parents because they saw he was a beautiful child and they were not afraid of the king's edict. By faith, Moses, when he had grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to endure ill treatment with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin. Considering the reproach of Christ, greater riches than the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking to the reward. By faith, he left Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured and seeing him who is unseen. By faith, he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of the blood, so that he who destroyed the firstborn would not touch him, touch them. By faith, they passed through the Red Sea as though they were passing through dry land. And the Egyptians, when they attempted it, were drowned. Let's read one more verse. Going back to the Gospel according to John, chapter 17. Gospel according to John, chapter 17 and verse 4. Jesus speaking of this uh, verse. I glorified you on the earth, having accomplished the work which you have given me to do. Let's, uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our loving Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time that you have given us and the thoughts that you have given us to meditate upon. May this time be fruitful for all of us here, O Lord. May the words of heavenly wisdom be broken and given to all of us. And we will be satisfied and uh, filled with it and be transformed by it, O Lord. We submit the whole time into your hands. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray. Amen. So the today's title is Glorifying God Through Our Lives.
So we are going to look at uh, this aspect or this doctrine or this theory or this commandment of God, how to glorify God in our life by looking at the doctrine itself and then looking at the example of Moses in the life of Moses, how he did that and from that we can draw some lessons for ourselves. Christian life as you know is not a bed of roses, it's not always smooth and rosy. If somebody is telling God is giving you eternal life, God is for you, He will never leave you nor forsake you, that doesn't mean you will not get into troubles, you will not get into difficulties, you will not lose a job, you will not lose a child, you will not be hit by something or get into an accident, nothing of that sort. If you take the disciples, all of them were martyred, except John, and all of them went through terrible lifestyles, not lifestyles, sorry, terrible life oppressed by the people around them. And not all of them had a very rosy life at all. They were struggling for the bare minimums in their life. They were living long periods in dungeons and jails. You can reflect on the life of Paul, right? And how he had gone through so many travels and so many uh, jail terms and so much of uh, persecution and so much of, uh, if you read in uh, 2nd Corinthians, he talks about how like he almost, you know, going to uh, death to the point of dying so many times and just coming back miraculously but serving, but he never lost faith in God, he never lost sight of God's plan for him. In the end of it, he said, I have finished my race, I am waiting to get the crown of righteousness from God. He is not complaining anything, but all and through and through, he enjoyed the leading of God in his life. So, if that is what the Christian life is, it's not all that bad, it's not the same for everyone. God takes you, different people in different roads. But whatever He takes us through, we may not be able to know, but we can experience and understand that Lord is always there, whatever may be the situation with us. So here, we are going to see in the, before we go into seeing application in the life of Moses, I want to Remind us one thing, what's going on in our lives? In a Christian life, when you become a Christian, what goes on? What is the purpose of God making us a Christian or making us to come into His kingdom? There is a great purpose. First, we need to understand what God's purpose is. It's not having our own understanding of what salvation is, but we need to understand what God is planning to have about. Why He had to come down all the way from heaven to earth. Why he had to live out all his glory and come down as a man, as a servant, as a slave, humbled himself to the grave, even to the point of death. So all these things why God has done for us, we need to have that as a background perspective to get a more understanding of what's going on in our life. In short, what God is trying to do to us is, by the way, I'll be asking maybe a couple of questions in between. You may want to answer so that we uh, have some interactive time. So, salvation is given by God. Salvation is given by God. And there is no other name under heaven by which anybody can claim salvation. It is only given through the name or a person for the work he did on the cross for our sake. Right? Let's get that perspective in picture. And when we know our position in front of the Lord, why he had come down for us? Because we were lost, because we were not able to come back to God. We were the, we were the king of our own lives. You know, if you ask one 
difference between the person who don't know God and the person who knows God. What is the one difference? Very simple terms. One difference. If you want to I if I ask you this question, let's say this is a question. What is this one difference? I want an interesting answer, but true answer. Not the regular thing we talk about. I want it in a nice phrase. One difference. Okay, tell tell what it comes to mind. I don't want to restrict you. <laughs> In Isaiah 53 and uh, uh, verse, six, verse six, all of us like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned his own way, but the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on him. Let's read this verse very carefully, the second portion of it, part B of this verse. Each of us has turned to our own ways, but the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on him. So. If you look closely at this, the greatest sin, the greatest iniquity which fall on Jesus Christ was to take care of the stand that we had, that is we went our own way. We were the king of our own lives. That's what this verse says. Each of us have turned to our own way. We were the center of our lives. And that God calls iniquity. You have not done any sin at all. But the greatest sin is you are you are the God of your life. And that is the sin. If anybody says I have not done any particular thing, ask him, what are you living for? It will be a list of all the things that he has for himself without any regard to God. That itself is the greatest sin. Out of that comes out all the other specific sins. So having us in the center or the throne of our lives is the sin. That is the nature, initial nature of us. When God saves us, He removes us from the throne and He comes and sits on our throne. And He takes care of our life. And we become His servants. So, that is the one difference. I mean, in a simple way, we can say God has become the throne of our lives. Initially, I was the throne of my life. All we like sheep are gone astray, each one in his own way. So, that is the greatest change that Lord has done. Is this. He has put his Holy Spirit in us. He is ruling and he is sitting on the throne for us. Now, he wants to direct our lives. He wants to uh, take care of our life, take control of our lives and to transform us day by day, day by day, day by day to overcome small sins, great sins and to become more righteous and to never think at all about sin, not to be worried about sin but to live a righteous life, to live a more righteous life and eventually to be transformed like the righteousness of Christ. That is the aim of God for our lives. So, in that process, what happens for us is, if we take ourselves, we can be divided into three personalities. We have our body, soul and the mind uh, and the spirit. Right? Thessalonians 5.23 talks about these three aspects. Right? Let's read that verse. Thess uh, First Thessalonians, Thessalonians, sorry. Uh, chapter 5 and verse 23. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you entirely and may your spirit and soul and body be preserved complete without blame at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you, brother. 
So here, this verse gives all the three personalities of us in one verse. That's the beauty of this verse. The God of peace himself sanctify you entirely. May your spirit, your soul, and body be preserved complete without blame at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let's take these three things together. Let's take the spirit. The spirit has got only two states. It's like a binary. Either it is dead or it is alive. Either it is dead or it is alive. The spirit. When you are not outside the kingdom of God, when you didn't know God, you were living in your own life, at that time our spirit was dead because we inherited that deadness from Adam. And when God met us and He forgave us our sins and He accepted us into His kingdom and gave the gift of His Holy Spirit, and when that started living in us, our spirit became alive. The spirit of God came and ignited our spirit. You can imagine like that. So our spirit was became alive. So what happened to the soul and what happened to the body? The soul earlier was under the control of the flesh. The soul was under the control of the flesh. So it has acquired all kinds of sinful thoughts and sinful inclinations from the life that it lived in association with the flesh. Now, when the Holy Spirit is driving our life, the soul is trying to learn newer things, holy things, righteous things from the Spirit. Now, what is the body doing? Or the flesh? The flesh God is, God's plan is not to disturb the flesh. Means, what the flesh was doing, it's going to do throughout our life. The soul has become alive, the, the, sorry, the spirit has become alive. Our soul is being renewed day by day. But our flesh is not touched by God. But it needs to be lived with the power of the Spirit. And that's the equation God has put in our lives. It's going to be like that till we die. So one, we need to understand the equation that's going on in ourselves. What is happening to our faculties, right? So why God has intended like that? Because He wanted to have a thorn in our flesh to remind us or to tempt us continuously. But uh, unlike in the sinful time when we lived without God, we don't have to worry now because with the power of the Spirit, we are going to conquer it every day and the soul is going to get renewed. So that's the equation God has put in our lives. Once we need to understand that thing, uh, then we can understand or cooperate or yield to God what He's trying to do in our lives. And not get discouraged when the flesh is disturbing you. Am I really saved? Am I in the will of God? So many disturbing questions will come for us. But once we understand who is the one who is causing problem, then we will be more complete and you know undisturbed in the presence of God. We know what to do. That's it. We should know what to do. Not to be worried about these things. But eventually when the Lord meets us, we will be transformed into a different body. And that body will not have this weakness of the flesh. That will be a glorified body. So that time, we will be with God in a different setup. There, there is nothing to tempt you or disturb you. So that is the equation the Lord is giving us here. So once we understand that, what is the Lord trying to do in our daily life? He is trying to renew our soul. The soul which was twisted and turned by the earlier thoughts or earlier ideas of us that is being straightened every day by God. Let's turn to Romans 12, chapter 2. Uh, sorry, Romans chapter 12. And uh, Let's read the first two verses. I 
I see you there for the red. Where the muscles are blocked, that we present your body is a living sanctuary. Slowly acceptable unto God, which is your residual service. And be not conformed to this world, but ye be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect to God. Yeah. So Romans chapter 1 and 2 talks about how to submit our body and our soul to God for this transforming work. And verse 2 talks about how that transforming work in the mind, I mean in the soul, happens by our transformation. See, it's like a, it's, it's like a twisted, uh, you know, it's, let's say a pipe with that. If it is twisted, you can't see, you can shine a torch at the one end, the light will not come to the other end because the pipe is twisted. So that, sometimes that will make us not to understand God's statutes or to appreciate God's statutes. We think, we complain God for His commandments. His commandments will become burdensome in those times. When the God puts us back, sets us back and straighten the slow by slowly and then the light of God can start flowing inside it. Then we start to understand His plan for us. Then we say, hey God, I didn't know this. Wonderful. This is what you are trying to do in my life. Thank you God. So that's what He says in Romans 12 too. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove what the will of God is. Or you may see it, experience it in your life what His will is, which is good and acceptable and perfect. It was not like that earlier, but now you appreciate its goodness, you accept it and you say, okay, this is the perfect thing for me. Right? And that's what is happening every day in our life. And Galatians 5.16 talks about the war that is there between spirit and the flesh. The flesh God has left it like that for a purpose. But we need to put it down in our life. We need to put it down under our feet with the power of the Spirit. Walk by the Spirit and you will not carry out the desires of the flesh. If you are complaining the Spirit is troubling you, you have to walk by the Spirit. It means walk by the power, guidance, instruction, everything that comes from the Spirit. So, that is the understanding we need to have in theory about ourselves. Then we can appreciate our, what when God tries to do something, then we can yield to Him in an acceptable way without complaining, without uh, you know worrying about oh, what will happen if I start yielding. It looks like a very impossible situation. Can I take a step in that direction? No. You know, all these things will disturb you unless you have a perspective of what God is trying to do and what is capable of doing. Let's take an example of uh, an illustration. We all know that, or at least the ladies know, this metal called gold, right? I mean, we gents talk about in a, in a physio chemistry way, it's a metal of gold. But for you, it's an ornament, right? And uh, one gram, two grams is not enough, you need a lot. Kgs or pounds in the way. You know, but this gold, you have it in pounds and kgs, it's not directly uh, mined in the earth like that. In the earth, it is like dust. Or in the earth, it is here and there, everywhere. And they have to take it out and it goes through a lot of cleaning process to become a shining gold on your neck or to adorn you. Before that, it goes through so much of process, you know. First, it goes through a physical process. When they take it, the cold pieces or nuggets in the soil, it is attached with a lot of dirt, mud or some kind of dirt. It's been there for ages. So they take it out and do a pressure water cleaning. First, they'll take out the physical dirt. So they'll do the you know, cleansing of that. And that removes all the uh, dirt that is on the surface of it. That removes, they scrub it, they rub it, and they take almost all the dirt. But that's not enough. They'll do some chemical cleaning they'll do. They'll 
some stains will be there that will not come out of just by watering or some you know some digital uh, attaching of some other things will be there that cannot come simply by uh, cleaning water cleaning so it has to be treated with chemicals so they treat with a different chemical so the chemical burns it and does something like that and removes that other impossible i mean sticking thing uh, impurity which comes out easily then what they do is they take the whole thing and throw it in the fire in the furnace in the furnace it melts when it melts really and the, because of the chemical process whatever is not gold is filtered off and whatever is gold just remains there and that filtered portion is gone but this gold is lost its shape it is now in a liquid form and then whatever the the goldsmith wants to do, he will make it in that shape. And then to make it even stronger, he will mix it with some alloy to make it even stronger and to durable. Right? So all these things process goes on uh, to make a beautiful gold out of this dusty gold. Imagine God is going to do the same thing with this gold which is sitting here, all of us. We were all muddy gold when God found us. Yes, there is gold in this, but it's been wrapped with so much of mud, so much of chemical process. So you need to go through physical cleansing, you need to go through chemical, you need to go through the uh, alloy you know, treatment that is being transformed into something else by treating you with a different metal. So that is what God does, figuratively speaking, in transforming our soul. Our soul cannot be transformed just like that. So, when we understand this is what is our problem, it needs to be taken like that. So now, we are going to see this transformation that went on by taking the example of the life of Moses. Just briefly, we will take the example of life of Moses. In fact, it goes on throughout everyone's life. In a little way or a bigger way or whatever way, everyone needs transformation. Everyone, you know, the song says, everyone needs compassion. Right? Like that, everyone needs cleansing, everyone needs transformation. This is called progressive sanctification. When you accept Christ, you are, you are sanctified in a, uh, you are justified. Means, you have a standing with God. But in fact, truly, really, there is cleansing is going to start then only. Then what is the difference, you might ask? You have become now in a position to cooperate with God. You don't desire to sin anymore. The desire to sin has gone away. Now you desire to serve God and to please God has come into you. With this, God is going to start the work of transformation. That's why we see when Christians also have fallen into various things and various temptations, various you know uh, sinful acts, which they are not able to you know take care of it because they have not yielded that area to God. Any area, you know, this is my personal opinion. Each one of us has got a, a weakness that is different from each other one. God has put that in that for a purpose. For some, it may be lying. It may be very difficult to suddenly tell the truth. Sometimes suddenly something pops up. For some, it may be stealing. If they see nicely something, they will quietly take one and put it inside. That, you know, they cannot come over that so easily. For some, it could be lust. For some, it could be love of money. Those things don't go easily. Think about it. If, for me, it could be something else. For you, it could be something else. God has put that purposely so that we overcome in that area. Each one of us needs to take care or examine ourselves. What is that troubling us? We may be proud, we may be happy that we have overcome one area, but there will be another area which will be nagging us all throughout our life, half the life. We will take more time to conquer. You know, there is a purpose God has put in that so that we live together as a body and you encourage me in the area you overcome 
and I encourage you in the area which I overcome, but which is your weakness. You see? And that's how this bonding grows. God has purposely put that. And also, to minister to God out of that gratitude that God has delivered us from the, the terrible thing that's which you are not able to do it at all. So, that's uh, the person that God has, wants to work in our lives. Everyone. Once we understand that, we should be willing to expose ourselves to God in that area. And God will cleanse us in that area and enable us, equip us in that area so that we come up to the image or transformation that is looking for us. So, where are we? Okay, going to the life of Moses, we can quickly see, apply this learning that we had now on uh, the transforming power of God, our transforming uh, work of God in our lives in the life of Moses. Why we are looking at this? In a practical way, God is also doing it in our lives. And when we understand that, we cooperate with God. And when we cooperate with God, God works more successfully and He transforms it from that pit into a plane, into a plateau. And that, when we do that and come to that level, and that in itself is glorifying God through our lives. Glorifying God through our lives is allowing God to work in our lives and allowing God to remove or transform us to the place where He wants us to be. And there, when we come there, then our life will be a glory to God. We'll be glorifying God with our lives in in reality, not just in speech or in our songs, in our writing, we write poems and books and things like that. But when the work God plans to do in our lives, we work it out in cooperation with God, and that's when the uh, glorification of God is being done. We saw that verse in John chapter 17, right, verse 4. Jesus Christ himself is in our example. He was telling like this, chapter 17, verse 4. I glorified you on the earth, having accomplished the work which you have given me to do. So one perspective that Jesus Christ is telling us is glorifying it to accomplish the work that God has given us to do. And God has given us to do, God Himself has to work in our lives. It is not going, we not, cannot be discovering it on ourselves. We cannot discover it on ourselves, we cannot do it on our own strength. But when we let God to work in our lives, then we glorify God by coming out of that position to another position where we are transformed and victorious over that area which was dragging us. And in the process, we are sanctified. And in the process, we do a great work in the kingdom of God, which will be useful for another generation to follow. That is what Moses did. And he glorified God because he brought the whole Egypt, the uh, whole Israelites out of Egypt, redeeming them from the slavery of the Pharaoh. So what, let's see, we all know Moses, Moses, how he was, though he was a child, he was raised up in the Pharaoh, Pharaoh's palace as the son of Pharaoh's daughter and uh, he was trained in all the wisdom and knowledge of Egypt and he had all the riches of Egypt, he had all the pleasure centers of Egypt and he, he had everything that a man can ever dream of in a normal way. He had the riches. He, he had the wisdom, he had knowledge, and he was very sound in speech also. Acts talks about that. If you read Acts chapter 7, Stephen telling about Moses, he says, He was very mighty in word and deed. Let's read this verse from Acts chapter 7. Verse 22. And Moses was learned in 
all the wisdom of the Egyptians and was mighty in words and in deeds. Okay, let's start there. He was mighty in words and deeds, right? He had all the wisdom. He learned or educated in all the wisdom of Egypt. And Egypt was the best country at that time, like America today. So, what is that Moses was not having and God started working in Moses. That's what we're going to narrow down quickly. He had all that thing what a godly person should have. Let's, let's pick up when Moses was grown up and he realized that he is a Hebrew and he needs to be taking care of his own kith and kin, the Israelites, who are slaves now. Let's pick it up from there. Chapter 11, Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 25. Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 25. Choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. So here we, in, in, in uh, Hebrews, when we read, Moses was already living a very godly character. He was portrayed as having a very good godly qualities, which we are going to see now. But still, it was not enough for God. See the standard of God. God has got high standards. If you think we are just, uh, uh, we get happier by doing a little good deed in God's kingdom, God's standard is much higher. But that is not to be discouraged by that, but God wants us to grow into that level. But He still appreciates and makes us learn at each level. First of all, verse 25 says, He has overcome sin. He is not interested in the pleasures of sin anymore. That's what it says. Right? I am just paraphrasing it for the sake of discussion. He already chose to endure ill treatment of the people of God than to enjoy the causing of sin. That means he has overcome the pullings of sin, of the great Egyptian pleasures. Now he has come over that itself. Still not enough for God. He was prepared to suffer as a result for the children of God. That's a very good godly quality. Very good godly quality, right? But still not enough. He was not interested in the riches of Egypt. 26, verse 26. Of Christ, greater riches than the treasures of than the treasures in Egypt, but he had respect unto the recompense of the reward. Yes, thank you. So here he has overcome a level higher, even the money or riches cannot touch him now. Isn't it great? Isn't it a great godly quality? Sure it is. Verse 27, he is not even afraid of any other worldly authority other than God. That's what it says there, right? Verse 27. By faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, nor endured as seeing him who is invisible. Yes. He is respect the invisible God and giving priority to the invisible God rather than the great fame. Isn't it a great godly trait? But it's not enough. What was that Moses was not having, which God wanted him to learn? Let's uh, read <coughs> Let's read Acts, let's turn to Acts verse chapter 7 and verse 22. He was operating in his own strength and not on the strength or the knowledge or revelation of God. He suddenly thought like, he, I need to go and save my people. Without the timing of God's call, he had the desire, godly desire. Godly desire is itself not enough. Godly desire has to meet the godly timing. 
But here he had a desire, but the timing was bad. So he operated in his own plan, in his own timing. Verse 22 and verse 23. Let's read verse 23. And when he was full 40 years old, it came into his heart to visit his brethren, the children of Israel. And seeing one of them suffer wrong, he defended him and avenged him that was oppressed. Ah, stop there, no one said. So he made his own plans, he made his own timings, and he made his own judgment. He did not wait for God to reveal the judge. He became a judge on his own. And verse 25. For he supposed his brethren would have understood how that God by his hand would deliver them. But they understood not. Not. He thought he would be understood like a great peacemaker. He is coming into the Israelites to mediate between them. But they understood him not. So he himself was a self-made peacemaker, a self-made plan maker, a self-made judge, and a self-made timing keeper. This is what God did not like in Moses. From the scriptural context, you can infer this thing. He had the godly desire, he had the godly quality. Sin was not a problem for him, money was not a problem for him. No bowing down to any authority. All three he was with God. But he was going by his works. The spirit of work is still in him. He has not yielded to the power of God and the timing of God. So many times if you look at our lives, we think many times it's tempting to do something for God. Right? Everything looks fine. Everything looks, the field looks fine. Everything looks fine. There are people to be heard. We need to be evangelized. We need to uh, go and help this poor. We need to do this thing. Everything is there. And you have the knowledge. You have the instruction. But still, if you miss the timing of God, if you miss the leading of God, what if God is leading someone else to do that job? and you go and disturb God's plan? You know, if you look from top, God is using 100 people, not just you and me. So 100 people are doing 100 jobs. And we are given our job at the right time for something, doing something. Take the example of the body. Each God is own work. So like that, we do our work as that by the head, that is God. So that's what was more lacking, that is, he was acting on his own strength. His self-will was not broken yet. He had a theory, he had a desire, but he had he was not broken. He was not broken because he wanted to do everything. He became his own God to the people. In a in a godly way, but that's not good. That's not good. Then because of this, he had to wait for 400 years. I'm sorry, 40. I had another zero. <laughs> it took God 40 years in the wilderness for him to train, to realize him, himself, I mean, to teach Moses what he needs to be in the presence of God, to break him down and lose confidence himself and to lose all the wisdom. The, I mean, the knowledge and the wisdom make them useless for this job. But God equipped him with the same job that he was trying to do earlier, 40 years back. To go to the same Israelites and to be a mediator between them and Pharaoh and to redeem them from that place into a different land, land of Canaan, all the way through great miracles and exhibition of powers of God. God was having a greater plan for them, but he stepped in very quickly inside, spoiled the whole thing, and he wasted 40 years of his life. And I don't know what all got wasted, but this is what we can read from the scripture. At least I was able to get these things here. So, that work 
which was Moses was planning to do earlier was not glorifying God because it was not in the plan of God. So if Moses had done that, it would be for his glory and not for God's glory. If God's glory was need to be proclaimed, it has to be done God's way and in the God's timing and it has to be done with the humility and the brokenness that the Spirit gives in our lives. So, what was the yielding that uh, Moses needed for God to be done? He, he was a great somebody in Egypt and he became a nobody in the wilderness of the desert. Right? And uh, he was a great, he living in his own palace. But here, he was living in his father-in-law's house for 40 years. Isn't that a humiliation? He was a great emperor. He was a shepherd looking up a few sheep and going into a mountain area where there is no, I mean, hardly anybody, people living there. All bushes and trees, few trees of course, some rocks, mountains. This was his life. Look at the downfall for him. All because all these things were in the mind of Moses which needs to be brought down for him to understand and say yes to the instruction of God and not to act in his own power. What all he learned, what all he equipped himself needs to be brought down one by one, one by one. And as a result of it, when God met him, let's fast forward a bit and after 40 years, now he is ready, he was broken down, he, he lost his identity. He gave up on himself, he lost his confidence and he is no more, you know, the great uh, uh, son of Pharaoh's daughter of Egypt. But he has become an ordinary shepherd, living in his father's house for his living and tending a few sheep. And at that point God meets him from the burning bush. Imagine our God, what a wonderful God, wonderful in the sense, He will not leave us, but he will make us a better person and he will make us use to do the same job or a similar job what God has planned for us but in the strength that he gives us. Let's go to Exodus chapter 4. And verse 10. And Moses said unto the Lord, O oh my Lord, I am not eloquent, neither heretofore, nor since thou hast spoken unto thy servant. But I am slow of speech and of the slow tongue. Yes. Yes, you have forgot how to speak. He is no more a great uh, you know, man of word and deed. He is, he is forgotten everything, or rather he is no more relying on the strength of speech. He says, Lord, I cannot speak. Verse 13, no confidence in himself. 14, verse 13. And he said, O oh my Lord, send, I pray thee, by the hand of him whom thou wilt send. Somebody. Send somebody else, Lord, not me. What was he doing that day? Did anybody tell him? He immediately ran and mediated and even killed the Egyptian there. Now he's saying, Not me, Lord, send somebody else. In verse 17, Lord says, And thou shalt take this rod in thine hand, wherewith thou shalt do signs. Yes. God is giving not a, not a machine gun. Not a great battle of men, army men. Just take his staff and go. I will take it. Isn't that wonderful? We need to have the time and we need to have the weapon of God also with us. We might be planning. So many things are good, but there is one thing Moses had to do was to deliver them by the rod. I mean by the what do you call it? Staff. staff. My staff. And God has put power in that staff. You might think for others it looks like foolish. But there is power in that. Nobody knows it. Only you and God knows. 
that's how God's servant operates. For others, he's just a foolish person. There's nothing great about him. But the power is residing inside. And it's only God equips that with the power. And now, Moses, finally, he agrees. I mean, he also says, I can't be sent someone else. And God attaches Aaron to him. And finally, God sends Moses. And when was that happened? Moses was totally broken. His heart was broken. His confidence was broken. Now he is ready to receive instruction. He has become so humble so that God can lift him up and start using him. Well, a Psalms, let me read this verse, Psalms 51. Verse 16 and 17 talks about it. For thou desirest not sacrifice, else would I give it. Thou delightest not in burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart, O God, thou wilt not despise. Yes. Our heart needs to be broken in the presence of God. 2 Corinthians 4 7 talks about a treasure in the earthen vessels. The Holy Spirit inside us is like a lamb surrounded by this vessel of ours. And God wants to break us so that that light can shine out from ourselves. Not our light, but God's light has to shine. For that, our will needs to be broken. Not my will, let your will be done. Jesus was telling God because God was executing a great plan through His Son Jesus Christ. And let's in finishing, let's quickly read these verses from Exodus chapter 4, 18 and 31. The reason we are reading is, if we are wondering what God was doing in Moses' life, He had planned everything so beautiful. You know, in verse 19, it talks about Verse, uh, verse, verse 19, he says, For all the men who are seeking your life are dead. So he has removed opposition from Moses' path now. Verse 21, He gave his power to Moses through the staff. God equips Moses with the miracle powers of God. And also, God teams up Aaron with Moses. Teams of Aaron with Moses, the body style of functioning. And also God hardens Pharaoh's heart out there so that this work of God gets more and more beautiful in that place and so that everyone will come to know the glory of God and start praising Him. And with great Joy in the sense like that battle will be like, okay, it will be a victorious battle so that you can come out not like a thief but like a great warrior coming out victorious from the battle. And God had so planned for them so that, you know, uh, in, uh, in verse uh, Acts 7 and verse 35, it says the reversal of what Moses was planning to do in the beginning. Acts 7 and verse 35 Moses and with great signs and wonders God brought those whole nation of Israel under the, from under the bondage of Egypt out into the wilderness and in all these things happened successfully because Moses yielded to God not on his own strength but on the will of God and on the timing of God so that God was glorified in this whole act of redemption of Israel from Egypt. That is a great task that Moses was undertaking. But for you and me also, there are similar tasks which God wants to be glorified in us, in and through us, by the things we do. And then we can also say, like Jesus said, I glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work you have given to me. So this is one act you can see is one phase in Moses' life. Next time maybe you can see 
how he glorified the wilderness through all the uh, through putting up with all the Israelites and the wilderness and so many things. So, in conclusion, let's apply these things to our lives. God is in work because we are a work in progress, and that work is the transformation of the soul from an unregenerate state to a regenerate state to a righteousness into the transformation power of God into the likeness of Christ. For that, we need to yield. When we need to yield and understand the work of God, like Moses, we can also say that we glorified God in and through our lives on this earth. Let's pray. Loving Heavenly Father, we thank you for this uh, life of Moses and how you worked in his life as a lesson to be taken for all of us, Lord, to glorify us not on the basis of the strengths we have, but to glorify you on the basis of healing to you, Lord, in our lives and to understand your timings and to understand your leadings and to eventually complete the work that you have planned for each and every one of us and thus glorify you in our lives, O Lord. We thank you that you are a good God, you will never leave us and forsake us. In Jesus' name we pray and ask. Amen.